Oh, oh, you almost ran it twice. <laughs> I almost ran the, the counter twice. Hello and welcome to yes. another edition of Dev Beard Ops. Um, this is, what is today? Wednesday, the 7th of July. Um, <laughs> yes, 7-7 seven, seven day. 7-7 seven, seven day. Kubus, tell us what we're going to be doing today. Before we kick that off, I first have to uh, use our usual slogan. Just remember, folks, it's the beard on the inside that counts. And the reason this yes. is very particular today is I actually had a dream last night about uh, this stream and my friend Darko there, in which I decided to surprise him and shave off my whole beard. <laughs> and then I had to like go like, yes, it's about the beard inside. I promise I've got a beard inside. And I had to spend a few minutes convincing him about this, which was quite amusing. So, yes, sometimes we do dream about work as well. But <laughs> getting back to, to uh, the stream for today. So... What I've been playing with the last while at home is that I have got a home network with a couple of containers running um, across different servers. I've got a little HP micro server um, that runs a bunch of them. And I've also got two Raspberry Pis that run two services for me that we'll dig into a little bit. And I got annoyed with remembering all of the different ports that things were running on and figuring out how to get to them. So I decided I'm going to do this properly. So I got um, traffic, which is a little reverse proxy up and running. And then I started playing with that. Uh, actually, traffic was running for a while, but I didn't okay. actively use it because I was lazy. And then what spurred me to do this was actively just doing a Docker pull on it. And it went from version 1 to version 2, which means my configs were broken. So everything is broken. So I set about fixing it. So toys. Um, let's kick off quickly. What, what have we got? Um, so I'm going to be sharing screen today with a bit of code here and then just to show you what things are doing and darker you can ask me fun questions but the the part about wanting to do it properly is that i also got annoyed with all of the ssl certificate warnings in the browser that i kept getting is this insecure so i click the more click the at the bo bottom there because i'm lazy so i said about fixing that as well so a couple of base things first that we need to understand um what is traffic how do i handle uh, ssl certificates and ultimately how do i automate all of this so Let's start off first. Um, and let me quickly share my screen. Um, I think it's somewhere. Let's just quickly open up traffic. Give me a second. Uh, screen share, share screen. Let's share this one. You cannot yes. share a screen without telling people you're going to share a screen, right? Yes. So I am sharing a screen, folks. Here we go. And doing it slowly. So let's just make this a little bit bigger because. Here we go. Now I should be able to see it nicely. Cool. So what traffic is, is just a reverse proxy. So it's basically okay. a little web server request, go to it, and it knows how to route them somewhere else using various mechanisms. In my case, um, I am using uh, the host headers. So when you specify a domain, like in my case, let's say um, pings.quibus.io, which is my personal yep. domain that I use for this, um, that request goes, to, does a DNS lookup. It sees what's the DNS record and then goes and sends it, obviously, the request to that. That request then hits traffic, which is the um, entry point that's listening on, let's say, port 80 or port 443 for SSL. And then from there, it decides, okay, where am I going to actually route this request now based on my configuration? Mm -hmm. So how that works is that when we open up the traffic dashboard, uh, let's just make this bigger as well. Oh, wait, it's not. There we go. You can see that it's currently, if I just go to the plain dashboard, oh, no, not that button. That button, uh, dashboard, there we go. So here we can see that I've got a bunch of services. They're all successful. They're all happy. You can all do a bunch of other things with, with it if you wanted to. Um, but what it currently has is you can see that it's configured to serve traffic to monitor.quibus.io, which is this actual URL to see what's going on and, and what we have up and running here. Um, then what we can see over here is I've got one um, currently configured, which is um, Home Assistant. So if I go home.quibus.io, um, you'll see it loads Home Assistant, which is just a open source um, home uh, automation thing that I've got a couple of temperature sensors and things that I'm busy playing with. And is, the important is, 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 is traffic uh, is traffic actually doing the DNS routing for you in this case, or DNS? Um... Resolve res resolution. Uh, no, it's just no. It's just doing the the reverse proxying of this. So when we look at this quickly, if I go to into my AWS account over here that I've got configured, you'll mm -hmm. see that I've got a bunch of entries over here that all point to one nine two one six eight five point five, which is the server where traffic is running on. I still okay. need to work on actually load balancing this across multiple servers because guess what? If traffic goes down, everything's broken. Yeah, and we will get to that. How to make this better a bit later in today's stream. So. 
I mean, you can see basically just simple A records that point there. But the big win here for me is if I look at Home Assistant over here, and if I can find my mouse, sorry, there's a bit of lag. If I click over here, it says this connection is secure and gives you the normal green for a SL certificate. And if I look at the actual certificate itself, um, it says um, it's issued by, you can R3. see this encrypt in here, R3, R3 which is uh, let's encrypt. Uh, from my understanding at least. So yeah. that's how I did this. So for those not familiar with Let's Encrypt, it is a service, I would call it, mm -hmm. supported by the EFF, which is yeah. the Electronic Freedom Frontier, not the local political party in South Africa, in case you're wondering. Um, and it allows you to issue SSL certificates for free that you can use and self-renew with a couple of caveats. The caveats being, you need to actually own the domain. So it's got okay. various mechanisms for checking that. The one is to publish a file on, let's say, corpus.io that it then accesses. Um, in my case, that doesn't help because I don't have a public facing service. Well, I do have corpus.io listening out there and running on, I think it's on Amplify at the moment, yeah. um, but I don't serve a file there and I don't have a web server that can actually serve a file with its little uh, encryption bot. So then, the second way you can do it is actually by doing a DNS validation where it um, creates a DNS record and it uses that to validate that they actually own the, rec uh, the, own the domain. Cool. Um, not Quibus, not Docker, not Docker. He, I think I think Cyclog yeah. is Cyclog is trying to run a bot command. That's not a bot command. That's just a meme <laughs> we play in because uh, Cyclog, I'm not sure if, you, if this is your first time on the stream, but um, there is a, there, we look similar yeah. alike, right? And people have, <laughs> people confuse us. I get called Cobus yeah. and he gets called Darko. So uh, we like to be um, tentatively called not Cobus and not Darko, hence the exclamation mark. Um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> you have not been scammed. You're just welcome to the stream. Uh, by the way, I just want to say hi to a couple of folks here. We have Ricardo yes. here. Hi, hi, Ricardo, welcome. Hello, Pradeepa. Welcome to the stream. And Ahmed, Ahmed is here as well. Um, uh, and you rock. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is, but uh, I, th mm. I, I think it's something similar to traffic, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, so, so NGROC is a way that you can actually open up local ports and I think it tunnels outward and then you send a link okay. to someone else and they can access a service running on your machine. Okay. Um, so in a sense, it's kind of like that, but what yeah. traffic does is a reverse proxy that all requests go into traffic and then traffic okay. from there knows how to route request to actually to other things. So okay. one of the other things, for example, is this home assistant that I've got running. Yep. And if I open up v VS Code over here, um, let me just quickly check where's home assistant, Docker Compose. I hope there's no password in here. No, there isn't. Um, over here, you can see what I'm doing is I'm running it in network mode host because there's some UDP and other network traffic that it needs to do, so it needs to host networking. Yeah. And then what I'm doing is I'm telling traffic that I just need to add this little bit to tell it to now start routing requests to it. So I tell it what gotcha. host header to look for, um, whether or not to use um, SSL, so TLS, and then yeah. also tell what cert um, resolver to actually use for that, and lastly, what the port is. So That's pretty cool. Yeah, we can uh, we, we can quickly dig into these. Yeah, question. Be before you continue, I just want to say again hello to a lot of folks. Tom Telecom, Ian is here. Im, good good evening. Uh, KD two thousand and nine. Um, while Kobus is talking, please let us know. Do you have yes. your container based systems at home? Uh, what do you run, and how do you manage it all? Um, mm. Kobus, I, I must notice something. Um, uh, your time zone is Europe slash Johannesburg. Um, is that the correct time zone? Uh, uh, no, that's actually a very good point. This needs to be Africa. This is just me copy and pasting. So thank you for that. I will fix this. I actually don't know if that has broken anything yet. I, to be honest, I haven't noticed. I'm sure but we have a Johannesburg in Europe somewhere. Now I need to go check all of mine. Uh, yeah, there I've got it right. Uh, smoking, Europe, London. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, let's fix all of these. Thank you. Uh, oh, that one's not running anymore. Here we go. Uh, this one doesn't even have it. Okay. Okay, cool. Alexa. Sweet. Okay. okay um, show us. Please continue. Yes. Show magic. Right. Show magic. So, um, the magic here that I want to show you is like, so all of this, wanting to be able to run these things. So, as a quick example, um, before, uh, where did that go? Here we go. Um, I have Smoke Ping running okay. on a... And let's actually open up that config quickly just to confirm with smoke ping. Uh, oh, here we go. Here we can see smoke ping is running, and I have mapped the default port 80 to port 8086, and this yep. is running on 
Um, in a uh, bridge network, I created a little network called web, and then all of them will reference this web. And this is a slightly important part. So okay. when you spin up a container on its own, you tell it to use bridge networking, it will spin up its own little um, virtual network for each of the containers on their own. And they won't be able to talk to each other. Now, this is sometimes where my networking knowledge of Docker becomes a little bit hazy because I had to learn some new things for this uh, specific implementation. But basically what happens then is I, I've created this new uh, network that you can uh, see at the bottom. I give it a, uh, and say, reference the external web one. So I did Docker, I think it's Docker create network or network new or something like that, command web, and then creates that network. And then what I say is every container that I now launch in bridge mode uses that specific same network. So they're all on the same network, individual IPs, which means that they can all talk to each other, which is important because traffic is on that network as well and doing that for us. Um, so just quickly, let's go to traffic just so I can show you what I do there. So traffic also uses that, but what I do is on the host, I, I remap or map port 80 and 443, so plain HTTP and HTTPS, and pipe that all into the traffic container, because obviously we want traffic that hits that IP to go into the traffic container, and then traffic sends it elsewhere to the side. Cool. You're with me so far, Doc uh, Darko. Doc Darko. Doc Darko. <laughs> yes. Cool. Right. So now that traffic is up and running, the next step was, OK, how do I go about, you know, sorting out uh, the SSL certificates that I want to do using Let's Encrypt. And that actually ended up being super simple, as in really, as in when I went to the documentation, um, where was it, Let's Encrypt? Basically what it says is that you need to um, uh, configure it. So if I use the Tomal one at the moment, so it's this is the full one. Uh, let's see quickly where it says, enabling <coughs> Acme. Okay. It basically says, configure these entry points over here. So this is what traffic users then to listen for. And then certificate resolver, uh, you define like that. And then you specify the challenge that it needs to do. So let's quickly look over here. Uh, what did I end up adding to my traffic file? Uh, it's down here, traffic tunnel. So I've got those two to sell, well, listen to there. And I've got something extra in here, which is this little redirect over here, which okay. says that if anything hits traffic on port 80, so if I just enter the normal um, URL for any of the services, redirect that to the web secure, which is HTTPS. So it takes care of that for me automatically. Yep. And the other ways you can do this by, I know, I think it's HSTS that you can register specific URLs and it won't even listen on port 80 and things like that. I didn't bother with that for now. Yep. Okay. Cool. Then this is just the bit that says enable the dashboard. Then what I have over here is that this is the config to actually tell traffic because it's got let's encrypt. Um, <clears throat> um, capabilities built into it, how to actually use it. So what you can see over here is I just had to set up an email address that I can get um, uh, warnings on. So nothing special here from my understanding at this point. There's nothing tied to this other than notifications. Okay. Um, it stores the actual certificates and the, um, so basically it gets private certificates, private public key pairs, and actually stores all of the config in this file. So this file is important. You don't want to lose this file. So okay. what I actually did with um, my traffic configuration, let's just get rid of that. That uh, there we go with traffic over here, as you'll see that it's actually mapped outside of this into a folder. And this is actually running on uh, my home server, which is running um, a RAID 5 um, uh, server, uh, so RAID 5 drive configurations. I've got four, four terabyte drives running in RAID 5. You can see them over here. They're all happy and up. And this config is actually stored on that specific locations. So I know that I won't use the, lose the config yeah. or lose the actual SSL certificates, which is obviously important to me. Um, then what I tell it is that I want to use root 53 to sort out my SSL certificates. And for that, it needs a IAM policy. Um, I'm trying to find it quickly. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think it was let's encrypt um, traffic and root 53. Uh, uh, I think over here it'll show us. Let's quickly load this. Um, but basically, it gave me a um, list or, uh, or an iron policy that I needed to do. Um, okay. I'm trying to find it quickly. It's, it's not a very, um, I can actually open it up here rather. Um, um, so, what, what, is, what, is this, what is this for, by the way? Um, so, what is, this, what's happening here? So, let me try to frame my understanding. Yes. Is it um, cool. traffic in order to. Um, verify that you have the, the actual domain ownership via the means of DNS 
it doesn't yes. query DNS. It actually queries Route 53 using the API. Yes. Okay. Okay. Correct. Why does it use it? Why does it use API for that? It, it, that's weird. Um, it, does it? Well, does it create a, a record or does it just query a record? It it creates a record to verify that you can actually modify oh, the domain. Oh, it creates so a record. Here okay. is, if you can modify the domain, you've got control of the okay. domain. You own the domain. Okay. So, sorry, I'm just quickly opening this up here. Um, I just don't want to share things because I'm not. I haven't spent enough time on this account to actually make sure that it's not exposing any of my like account <laughs> details and things. So I will bring the screen back now that I know it's safe. Ish, okay. I hope. Come on. Add to stream. There we go. So this is basically the what it's allowed to do on my account because um, I created a new user for Certbot and then created uh, this policy to add okay. to that specific thing, which is it can list those to zone. It can get changes to them and change the record sets. Um, and then also it's allowed to list host zones by name. So okay. actually, I realize now that when I think about this, given that this doesn't allow it to actually make any changes because this is list get uh, oh, it can actually do a change. change resource resource resource. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So it can make a change. Okay. So it does some kind of validation in the back end. I actually don't okay. know how that works, but basically I created this user, created okay. an AWS uh, API key pair, so uh, uh, an ID and a secret. Yeah. I configured that as the default one on this specific server, um, okay. which I'm not going to show you because guess what? I'm not going to share my credentials with you. Sorry, Darko. You are out of luck today. <clears throat> and then I restarted traffic. And then things happen magically in the background, and I suddenly had SSL certificates. Because when I go to traffic over here, you can see that, guess what? This is also a valid certificate. But I didn't issue or install the certificate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, just, just a quick update to all the folks joining here. We have a bunch of folks joining now. So thank you all for joining DevBeard Ops. This is a show where two bald guys talk about DevOps, the cloud, and AWS. Um, and today's topic is about doing containers from home. And Kobus is currently showing how one of the services he's running from home traffic is being configured and it's like doing its uh, certificate validation using Route 53 and all that stuff. So uh, if mm. you have questions, if you have comments, please leave them in the chat on that side. Um, let us know if you are running containers at home. Uh, what yeah. are you running and why? Uh, and why are you not running containers at home? That's a bigger question. So yes. uh, yeah, we would like to hear from you. Kubus, mm. continue. Yes, and Darko, now that I've read the message you sent me, I will try to speak a bit slower. Unfortunately, this is what happens when I start talking about something where I had a lot of fun as I start talking a lot faster and faster and faster. And then we're... So please also shout in the comments if I start going too fast. Um, it's As you can see, I actually quite enjoyed this little adventure that I went on. So I will try to speak slower. Thank you, Darko. Cool. So at this point... Um... Yeah, so quickly, actual aimer. Um, I run these containers on a little home server. That's my, it's a HP, HP Micro Gen 10, I think it is. Um, these little gray square, they're literally this big. Uh, it's actually sitting right here behind me. Um, and um, it just is small, it's light on power. I think this yeah. one, last time I measured it was 35 watts or 30 watts or that kind of range with four spinning rust hard disks. So the normal with disks rotation, mm -hmm. ro rotating hard disk disk drives, four of them. Um, it's like super low and it just runs and it's got a i3 in it, 12 gigs or 16 gigs of RAM. Um, that's it. But that's not the only one I have. I also have two separate Raspberry Pi servers. The one runs my Pi hole, which serves DNS in the home network and also filters out uh, ads and uh, malware and those things. Yep. Um, and then I've got a second Raspberry Pi that runs my Unify controller, which is from Ubiquiti. Um, and what that uh, does is, is that controls all my different home devices, like my Wi-Fi access point, my managed switch, and all of those things. The reason I have them separate is that those are kind of fairly critical services, yeah. and I don't want when the service, when I play with it and I break Docker, to take that down. So now we get to the fun part. Let's show you how to add another container to this when I bring up a new one. Um, uh, RAVN, I do not have Ubiquiti running on Docker on the Pi. Um, I had it at one point running on in a container. Um, at this, I think the decision to just run directly is it's on a little Raspberry Pi. There's nothing else on it, so I just run it there. But I have run it as a little Pi before, um, as a sorry, as a container before. Um, you can actually still, if you look here in my thing, you can see there's the 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 folders actually left from when I had it in a container. And then I just decided not to because of basically um, not wanting to have everything go down at the same time. And then I just felt like new Pi. Yeah. 
installing docking and maintaining uh, let's just install it as a package and not worry about it type thing because i'm lazy yeah i see i um, see ruan becker here he he runs a bunch of things uh traffic bitcoin mm. and pie hole rocket chat grafana prometheus loki sing thing wire garden htpc wow uh, yes i had studio. some of those things you can see over here prometheus and jenkins and gitlab and grafana i was playing with them at one point um as containers as well i just don't have enough use for them at the moment i do want to get prometheus and grafana back up again yeah. Um, at some it's point be it's but, beautiful yeah. that you can run all those things in containers right so uh, oh yeah it's like i do a similar thing i have a little intel nook and i run a bunch of my pie holes and whatnots on it so it's just wonderful that you can isolate them completely and not having to install things on a server directly oh, yeah. so that's just a fact yeah and then running into <laughs> install messes like i've got one the unify nvr software mm -hmm. needs a very specific version of java if you yep. uh, download the latest one it breaks so i've got yep. that running on a separate server actually just because i don't want to deal with that and i don't want to overload the server um but yeah it's it's super useful um o omg 4301 that's not a command by the way so <laughs> get, <I still laughs> we, we confuse people here we need to introduce this command to a bot um so oh, yeah. the, the commands, the, the, the exclamation mark Cobus and exclamation dark, uh, mark dark, Darko is basically not Cobus and not Darko because we look alike. Um, and, and we often have to us. say, sorry, I'm not Cobus. Exactly. Oh, I'm, I'm not sorry, Darko. I'm not Darko. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the whole joke. So it's not a command, unfortunately. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So rambling on. We now had that up and running. We've got Let's Encrypt and uh, Configure in Traffic. It's serving reverse DNS. Yep. And like I said, I have got um, Pi-hole running as well, which is over here. You can, oh, in that Pi-hole smoke thing I want to show you. Um, so actually Pi-hole, you can see over here is also just SSL. It's running, it's working. Yeah. Um, but we'll get to that config in a little bit. So now let's say I spun up a new container and I want this to work. What I had to do okay. before, if I want to access this, is first remember that it's on port 8086. Also yep. make sure that those port, uh, ports don't clash with other containers that I'm running uh, because you map them by doing this on the container. Let's see, smoke's ping over here. You can see I've got that mapping, which is the containers port mapped to the actual host port. And that's the thing that ultimately also annoyed me is like I had this long list of things and then I would remove a container and then spin up a new one and then I ran out of port numbers and just nightmare admin. So. <laughs> How do we get this onto traffic? Because if I go to traffic now and I say, uh, let's just replace this with things.quibbles.io, it says not found because guess what? When I look at my config over here, HTTP services, we can see that while smoke ping is here, um, it's trying to route it to that port, but it's there's no rule for it to know how do I you know, send it traffic there actually. Um, so what you need to do is you go into your uh, just in my case, Docker Compose file. And what I do is I tell it that, hey, listen, the URL pings not um, is going to be used for this port 80. Please note here, and this is something I got confused with the first time, is like, because traffic's running on the same bridge network as the other containers, you specify the container port, not the map port on the host. Because I sat here for probably half an hour trying to think about why is it not connecting? I specify the right port, all of that. Yeah. Also, in this case, you don't actually have to specify port 80. You can take out this line. Okay. Uh, because if the container only exposes one port, um, it traffic will automatically map the route to that okay. to get it there. Yeah, and that's how you do it. So basically, you just add these on. So that now, I just tend to leave these so I can access them if I need to. We save the file. Um, we go into the folder. This is smoking. Uh, and then, uh, uh, not restart. Ah, come on. Uh, Docker compose down and Docker... Uh, compose up and detached. Sorry, actually, let's just dismiss this. Cool. Um, hopefully, you can read that. It's not too small. Yeah, it's basically it's just fine. Docker down, Docker up. Um, and what this will do once it comes up, let's give it a few seconds. Cool is in traffic. Now, I want to go over here. Is we can see here's smoke ping. Okay. Um, let's see, HP routers. We can see all of a sudden there's now this little shield, which means it's got an SSL certificate. It does that if I click on the actual HTTP server over here, if I go to smoke ping, you can see there's still routing over there, but there's now this routing rule for pings. And now if I go to this and I refresh this, guess what? I get to smoke ping and yeah. guess what? It's got a proper SSL certificate. Nice. Which is nice. And, yes. And, like, and it's even if it's resolving to like a local IP address, right? So I guess this yeah. is pings.co.io is a 195 thing, 192, right? 
Yes. So remember, this is a container that I or a service that I run inside a container. So now I can automatically map to it. So my next thing yep. that I want to do is, well, I've got my Pi hole running and I've got my unified controller running on static IPs, which I statically assign through my microtech router to them. Okay. Um, how do I actually get traffic to go there? So that's the next part I want to show today, which is because that also was a little bit of head scratching, like how would I go about doing that? So what we need to do there is to actually change traffic's configuration. So what I have in here is there's a static configuration and then there's a dynamic configuration. And all that means is that there's an extra config file that I then can add things onto that traffic knows how to go read and actually use that as a configuration. So what does that actually look like? Um, over here, cool. At the moment, by default, it just has the actual dashboard configuration for traffic itself in there. So traffic, yeah, it's one of those like brain things that traffic itself knows how to route, route to its own traffic uh, dashboard because it accepts okay. the traffic. But now we want to add, let's say, uh, our pie hole in. Let's do that one first. So what I need to grab over there here is I just plonk it over here so I can just copy and paste is I add a new service, which is the pie hole. It uses load banner service. And I tell it that it runs on that specific IP, uh, 5.8.80. So I can actually just open that in the browser, uh, put that in here rather. And what you can see over here is this is where my pie hole is running. So we can see that it's running insecurely okay. on there. Cool. Okay, then what I also need to copy over there is, so that's the actual server. So I'm telling traffic, hey, there's a new service out there. Um, it's listening on that static IP address, but I still can't root to it because I haven't added a router, which is a config construct inside traffic as well. So what I need to do for that is to grab this, which is the routing portion. So I can plonk this uh, down here. I actually don't know if the order makes any difference, um, but you can see over here now I've got a new router for Pi-hole. Um, and we can say that the rule is for that host, and it's going to use this web secure one, which is um, port 403, and it's going to point to the service um, pile. So this is how you wire it up. So you, similar to Kubernetes, when you spin up a uh, pod, you expose it as a service, and then you have to add an ingress rule to say, okay, well, I'm going to go from the ingress to the service, which actually goes to the individual pod to actually okay. get um, things there. And you can see over here, it's not a lot of... Um, Complicated. The big important part over here is that I tell it how to actually get the TLS for this, which is using Let's Encrypt. Okay. Okay. I think this might be taken care of. Well, this is taken care of by those labels that I put on the actual container. So if I go back here to Smoking, so it's similar to over here where I tell it to use TLS and I tell it to use Let's Encrypt. But in okay. this case, what I'm doing, because remember, this is not a container, so it doesn't know to do that automatically unless I tell it to okay. actually go and do that. Cool. So we get that. And then now what I have to do is I just have to Docker restart my traffic container because it needs to obviously load this configuration. Um, I think there might be a way to do dynamic configuration. I haven't spent time on that. So there might be that. Uh, but if I go to traffic now, no, what I can see over here is that hole. I now have PyHole and it can actually root to it. And if I go over here and I say, uh, I think it's PyHole, I.O. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, I need to go to slash admin to get the dashboard. We've got pile running and it's awesome. all right. Right. Awesome. Great. So now there's one last trick that I need to show, which is uh, no, not this one, not you. There we go. Which is for my Unify load balancer. So basically, okay. to the same thing, uh, a router for um, the Unify controller that I have running. Okay. And then also. And you, yeah. Unify is not running within a container, right? Mm -mm. Okay. Also running on a separate um, Raspberry Pi. Okay. And it's also got a service, and this you can just put under, so on a single HTTP service where the router is a top hole, a, a top level one. Okay. And I go in here, where's my service up here, and I plonk that in there, and I save it, and we do a Docker restart again. Um, let's wait for it quickly. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, you do a lot of Docker restarts. That's the one thing that uh, got me a little bit with all of this. Um, There's a question coming um, in from M17. Yes. Um, yes. Can you add a container inside the? Uh, you can. It involves you running certbot inside of the container. From my understanding, it's, I don't yeah. think you can add it externally. And because if you think about it, the container itself, if it wants to use it as a salt certificate, it needs to provide it inside the container itself. But that kind of goes like against the whole point of this, um, because what you want to do with um, reverse proxies and service meshes and things is to take common functionality, 
and take it out of the container and host that externally so that there's a single thing that manages for you instead of having five different containers with five different let's encrypt configs to all fetch their own certificates. Rather have a central thing like your reverse proxy that then starts going into service mesh world actually yeah. deal with that for you. Okay. But continue the questions, please. Um, the whole point here is to have a little chat and have fun. Um, so now I've added my Unify one, and that runs on unify.quibus.io. Containers we started. Let's just make sure I can see it. Uh, so there's Unify. Yep. There's the HTTP service over here. Unify is by the file provider. You can see it points to that one now. So now this, when I plonk that in there, and I go in there, eh, it's not happy. Okay. And this was like, also took me a bit of time to actually figure out what is going on here. Now, what is going on is the following. When I go to my configuration over here, let's quickly grab this. And this is where my annoyance with this whole world started, actually. And I plonk that in the browser. You get this message, which I'm sure all of you have seen if you run anything at home. Guess what? The certificate that you're trying to hit is not valid because if I click over here, we can see that it's not a valid one. Now I can say in advance and I can say, okay, cool, proceed to the actual Unify site, which is over here, my Unify controller. The reason this happens is that the SSL certificate is not valid and okay. traffic by default will not direct traffic to an insecure SSL certificate that it doesn't it, it, it can trust. So there are two routes over here. Firstly, you can go to this server, download the certificate, upload and add it to traffic saying, okay, please trust this certificate in future. But if I regenerate this, uh, let's say what's container, I recreate the container, it's build a different certificate and I have to go trust that one again. So to get around that, there's the last little config that's useful, uh, which is over here, which is this part, which says insecure skip verify. So it skips the verification of insecure um, certificates. And this is a top level config for uh, traffic. So you add it in the main traffic toml file and then actually just save it. And guess what we have to do again, Docker? Oh, Docker, Docker. you're now called Docker. Hey, Docker, how are you doing today? <laughs> Restart Docker. Cool. Uh, where's that? Uh, this one. And now if I just refresh this, uh, guess what? Voila. It is all working and magic. Wow. So what this makes me super happy is I'm now at a point where I can literally, if I want to spin up something new, let's say Jenkins or GitLab, I need to add a root 53 record entry to actually okay. point to 5.5. I can probably add a wildcard record as well for that. Um, I don't want to because I might have other subdomains that do other things at some point. Um, I haven't really decided yet, but that would be a way to deal with this or to just move this to a complete subdomain. So let's say uh, home.quibus.io or containers yeah. or whatever, and then point everything there. Um, but that's the next step. Now, where we are going to start chatting Darko is that the things that I haven't done yet is you saw me editing a whole bunch of Docker Compose files and yeah. doing everything by hand. And we are DevOps people and we do not like to do it that way. So... <laughs> This is not the lazy way. Yeah, I want yeah, to start yeah. managing it. So okay. the next step for me will be to figure out how to bring in potentially ECS to manage these for me okay. on-prem using ECS Anywhere uh, or um, run Kubernetes or something. Um, I haven't quite figured that out. Okay. But there's also service, server maintenance at the moment that I need to do, which um, basically, if I want to show you how I do server maintenance at the moment, uh, let me just open this up again, uh, hide that. So it's basically this. Uh, uh, sudo apps, get upgrade dash yes. I think I actually put a, a yes in here. So this is currently my super evolved how I manage all my hardware. Okay. Um, the server itself, as you can imagine, this is not yeah. great. I can already see you getting uncomfortable. And then if you want to see how I do my Docker upgrades, <laughs> you see this great file? Okay. Wow. You see this great one? Yeah. Wow. This is literally I'm doing it at the moment. Um, yeah. Damn. So as you can imagine, this is not stable. This is not good. It uses the latest um, tags for all of the containers. Um, I already got burned by this when I upgraded traffic accidentally. Well, not accidentally, intentionally, but didn't realize there was a version 2 of tra traffic coming out of my config files didn't work. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, Portainer. Um, so, Joven. Sorry. Jovan, thank you, Darker. <laughs> um, <laughs> is talking about Portainer. I actually don't know Portainer, so I will need yeah. to put that on my list of things to play with. But I mean, um, Darker, so you've had a little bit more experience playing and managing servers at scale. Um, yeah. 
tell me what I need to install next now. I need to do this. Um, yeah, I mean, so when it comes to managing managing servers, um, actually managing containers, be that on premises, be that in the cloud, and in this case, we're talking about just home containers to help with your networking. Um, I found that uh, that actually using some of the AWS features helped me a lot. Now, with a this comes with a caveat: it costs you money. Um, mm -hmm. Using services such as AWS Systems Manager for uh, managing operations on, on instances can cost you money uh, if you breach a certain threshold. So, um, but what I do home at home because I have a couple of servers, um, like my main my main. Uh, um, container server, my main Docker server sitting in a, in, a, in a rack next to me. And I also have this thing. It's like my, my little Raspberry Pi rack, uh, mm -hmm. which runs Docker on itself as well. Um, the way I manage and configure all of these things is just uh, just use a systems manager. AWS systems manager is a, is a f service from AWS to basically just uh, manage your infrastructure. Now that can be with uh, you know, by running your commands, if you wish like that, you can remotely re execute those commands without even having to SSH into the system by creation of run books. Or you can do, you know, more more complex things by introducing configuration management with Ansible um, or, or Chef or even Puppet um, through Systems Manager, right? So that's a really okay. neat way to kind of manage those things. And then we have Ricardo mentioning here, uh, giving a plus one to ECS Anywhere, um, this is a new service that, came, that well, feature basically of ECS that came out recently, I think, uh, where you can actually uh, run containers under the ECS orchestration engine anywhere. <laughs> so, okay, ECS for those who do not know, ECS is a service that basically it's a it's a container orchestrator on top of AWS. How it works, you launch your virtual machines, your EC2 instances, you use your Fargate, your serverless containers, and you manage them all under the ECS umbrella. You have your services, you have your tasks, task definitions, and all those things. However, you were limited to running containers exclusively on top of AWS. Sometimes um, you may want to manage your containers somewhere else, like, for example, at home. So uh, what ECS gives you the ability to is basically to bring in external servers, instances, Raspberry Pis uh, as um, cluster members, right? So you introduce like a Raspberry mm. Pi as a cluster member to your ECS cluster, oh, sorry, to your ECS uh, well, cluster, yeah? Um, and all of a sudden ECS can actually deploy container tasks onto that thing. So it is a really, really neat, neat way to do that. So. Um, I've, I, I have, I have not, not yet um, gone into the full-on weeds with ECS anywhere, but it's a really, really great thing. Uh, and we see, uh, again, Ricardo is, being, is playing around with this, and uh, his comment is that um, he has deployed an application in a hybrid environment, right? Uh, runs a single application, uh, deploys it into ECS, and via a load balancer, which is amazing, you access your application, which is running at home, via load balancer in the cloud, right? So think of think of your smoke ping or your traffic or well these are not applications you wish to have publicly available but let's say you have something that's that you wish to have publicly available um, you want to run it at home but with the ability to actually um, serve it from the cloud which is pretty cool I think I think uh, ECS anywhere is, is just a great thing right um, yes I uh, actually want to go ahead clear answer one of the questions we have here regarding EC anywhere <laughs> uh, from L4 which is struggling with EC anywhere if I can find my mouse sorry it's yeah, put it here uh, oh, oh. <laughs> sorry um to create a virtual tunnel between Raspberry Pi and ECS anywhere uh, suggestions yes um give me two seconds to get you the link no not okay. that one uh so we have a uh developer advocate on the containers team called Nathan uh Peck um who did a very good Guide on this. Uh, here we go. Uh, let me share my screen again quickly. Uh, bring that up. Come on, click. Eh, there we go. Uh, no, okay. Not this one. Oh, yeah, actually, I hosted it on the official AWS blog. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, cool. Um, basically, um, I will pop the link over here quickly. There we go for the folks that are watching. Um, and what we have over here is that he went through the whole architecture of setting things up. Here is the um, the VPN he actually sets up between yep. his VPC and the cluster of Raspberry Pis that he has. I think he uses one of them to be a gateway for the rest of the cluster. And then they route their traffic through them. But basically in this 
he takes you through every single step um, that he uses over there, what hardware he uses, how he built it, um, setting up the um, how to register them. Uh, and if I remember correctly, here we go. Here's a section on how to set up the site to site yeah. VPN that he uses that to actually do that, um, yeah. which is super useful about it. Um, but make sure to check out what what Ricardo is also writing. He is going to be creating a blog post and all of that stuff. So uh, I actually need to chat with him today about all all that stuff uh, because uh, we are preparing something regarding ECS anywhere to show on on a future event. Yes. So yeah. Say. So, um. So question from ooh, Dragunov: Can I do yes. all this with the free tier in AWS? Um. No. No, Unfortunately, no. so the ECS anywhere, if you're running it with an on-prem or non-AWS run instance, there is a charge of a month for it. Um, yeah. I actually don't know what offhand what it is. Yeah. Uh, ECS anywhere. anywhere. Dragunov, Dragunov 308, if you have a, a concrete idea you want to do something, if you have a project, reach out to us directly. We may be able to provide you with maybe some AWS credits. So mm. um, reach out directly to us via social media if you have, want. Um, with your idea, and we would be happy to support you. If if yes. if a cost is a factor, right? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, over here it says it's what's it, one point zero two five cents per hour. Per so twenty four cents a day, whatever that is, times thirty, yeah. uh, seven and a half dollars, I think, per month. So yeah. yeah. And of course, you to make use of ECS anyway. But I mean, I mean, from my perspective, I'd be happy to pay this out of my own pocket. Just the yeah. amount of time that I'll save doing this. So yeah. I'll probably do this in the next um, uh, next, next week or so, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll report back next week's success, depending on how the rest of this week goes and uh, if the kids let me sleep, but we will see. <laughs> yeah, so yes. so there's different ways you can manage your containers, again, on the, on top of AWS, uh, sorry, at home, right? So your your home, home network containers, how you can manage them using the cloud. So ECS Anywhere is an orchestration engine. However, to manage those underlying instances, um, and you will see that in Nathan's uh, in blog post is that you use AWS Systems Manager agent, which is just a little mm. um, agent installed on top of your running instances, and it has native support for Raspberry Pis and for all major OSs. Um, you install the agent, and then you have full, well, full as much as you give it access to that operating system remotely, which means installing packages, running remote commands, running playbooks and runbooks, all of those things is possible through the, the powers of AWS Systems Manager. So uh, uh, AWS <laughs> Systems Manager, a little, a little tool, a little feature that kind of sits in the back and does a lot of things for for oh, yeah. the, for more the, for the more sexy features out there right <laughs> mm. so i mean for yeah. like for sysadmin stuff it's like one of those services the first yeah. time i discovered i think the first thing i discovered was parameter store and i was kind of like i can store configs in here and i can use a command to actually get them um it was like amazing because there's even some people have built little um uh, apps i can't remember exactly what it's called but SSM env, I think, is the one um, where you specify the path and you say, so you prefix in your Docker container, you say SSM env, and then the actual path that it needs to grab it from, and then the actual container's entry point. Um, and then it'll automatically grab all of the configs under that path, change them into uppercase underscored um, config values as environment variables, and pass them into the container without you having to do anything. Um, and I used that quite a lot in the past. Um, and then also that run command, like for those folks not familiar with it, is you can execute, set up a document inside uh, AWS that says do the following things like a bash script and then say go run this on the following servers. And you can give people access to be able to run that script but not modify that script. So in my use case back in the day, it was I had to restart a service um, on a server remotely, but I didn't want to give root access to the developers because sometimes they didn't know what they're doing and I don't want <laughs> them to be able to break things. So I took this, created this. Um, come on inside a, a document it's called inside SSM run Tomsk um, gave them access to that coupled that into a Jenkins job so they could literally go into Jenkins and say please restart the server click and Jenkins would merrily go and execute that AWS command that then executed the actual restart command which is quite useful yeah exactly exactly like um, l let me actually show you this uh, maybe, I, maybe I can maybe I can show this as well so uh, thingy thingy I'm going to share a screen that. as well so, uh, zoom in. I apologize for my very loud keyboard. That's just the way it is. Um, <laughs> so, share, share, share. Window, window. Yeah, I'm window. just happy my keyboard is still working. I lost my uh, RGBs on my mouse yesterday. Ah, okay. My headphones <laughs> melting. 
Ooh, that's not good. Yeah. So I actually the 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 uh, the nook next to me, so I can just SS. I'm currently from my home, like I can SSH um, into my into my nook and just you know do my passwords and all those things, right? So I'm running currently at the the thing that runs my all of my Docker containers. Now, if I want to do this remotely, if I want to do this from somewhere else, um, I actually have this instance being managed by the Systems Manager. To do that, uh, I can just do AWS SSM uh, start session, and then uh, target is my instance ID. However, because this is my home instance, it doesn't have a proper instance ID, right? It's not your standard EC2 instance. Mm -hmm. It has something called a managed instance. So it starts with MI. You can get this thing um, from your SSM console. This is, however, mine. If I do this, hopefully, uh, ooh, plugin is not installed. Ah, damn. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, I don't have a plugin installed on this on this box itself. The thing you need here is plugin. What what will what it will do? The plugin will emulate SSH. So it, do, <laughs> it doesn't use SSH per se. It emulates SSH over port eighty uh, port port four four three, right? So let's actually install the system systems manager plugin. Uh, so this oh yes. Live demoing. Live demoing, yeah. Uh, install the plugin for Linux. Linux, curl, Intel, Intel, this is fine. So um, paste like that. Oh, RPM. Why RPM? Ubuntu, wait, not that one. Ooh, wait, you're, you're Arch person, aren't you? Yes, but this is Windows, so WSL, right? Oh, um, that just confuses me. Uh, I, what is the session manager? That, that oh. Will this work? Okay, cool. Uh, this doesn't look good. Uh, starting session post and start not found. Start um, not found. Stop not found. Ugh. Okay, let me try again. <laughs> um, maybe it works. It works. There you go. It's just a Ooh. problem with install. Now you can see that I'm currently uh, running as SSM user, but uh, if I cat at the host, uh, uh, host, host. <laughs> Oh, this is the one thing I hate about the, the Windows Linux thing is like the ups and downs and some of the clickings and things aren't quite yeah. the same. So so I've actually now connected to my home NUC system through the power of the internet. And um, actually, I'm going to switch to Bash. Uh, so uh, basically, I am running um, this as SSM user. I can switch to Darko, of course, uh, to my, my default user. And I'm now running fully inside of my, in so my, inside of my system through the internet through SSM, mm. so all of those things. It, it's it's wonderful, right? So uh, I, I am a big fan of that. And um, I actually I actually had to use this. I was home for vacation, but I had to pull something off of my NAS in Berlin. So I went to Serbia on vacation. <laughs> I needed a file from my NAS. And I'm like, okay, what do I do? My NAS is not exposed to the internet. However, this thing is. So I, I mm. SSH into my system through the power of Systems Manager, Session Manager, and just grab the file. So, um, just a little thing. Again, this is a very edge use case. You wouldn't use this just because for fun, but uh, you can basically take all of your Raspberry Pis, associate them to Systems Manager. Number one, you will have this kind of SSH access to all of them from anywhere if you have permissions. Number two, you can actually execute specific run commands, specific um, scripts, specific things on top of those systems to, for example, install Docker, right? Um, and, and such, right? I wouldn't go manually mm. on each of these Raspberry Pis and set up Docker one by one because that's not fun. <laughs> uh, so so doing, it, doing it more automatically with, for example, Systems Manager is, is, is kind of the way to go. So yeah, mm. um, so th that was good. Um, Kubus, yes. will you attempt to manage this again through some ECS Anywhere or at least Systems Manager or something like that? I know this is all manual oh. and you mentioned that you want to do it more automatically. Yes. So plans at the moment are that I definitely want to use ECS Anywhere just you know because it's an AWS service that I haven't played with yet. Yeah. Um, but also second reason is remember all those broken um, deep braces I have? Yep. I, I have got a plan for them, which is to run a proper big ECS cluster. So I'm going to start slowly fixing them up and figuring out which ones work and which don't to actually do that. But also because I can actually configure all of this using Terraform. Because remember, Terraform can set up my ECS cluster, yep. ECS Anywhere, and all the ECS tasks and things that I want to run. Because ultimately, I want to get to a point where I've got a proper CI/CD pipeline for this that I just put commits to and it actually sorts it out for me. Um, because I want to get to a point where if the server dies, and it will die at some point, yeah, I don't have to deal with that complexity. And 
that's currently my challenge is that how do I get to that point? Because I've I've had to redo the server once and it was an absolute nightmare. So the first step for me now is like I've taken all my Docker configs, I've actually committed okay. them to private GitHub repo. So all the Docker compose files. So if that server breaks tomorrow, um, I'll be very sad. Um, <laughs> but I should be able to get the config files off the actual disks itself because it's RAID 5. Mm -hmm. uh, I still need to figure out, probably get an S3 backup job of some kind. They just yeah, they just yeah. pipes it up to S3 every night. Um, and then I can just go and replace the server if I need to. But if you, if you run things from, like, for example, if you run things from ECS anywhere, you do not have to rely on having no. uh, those configuration files stored anywhere mm -hmm. because uh, if, if the... If the well, actually, if the if the data from the containers is being stored uh, elsewhere, you're just fine. You can just you know add new clusters to your cluster, to your ECS anywhere cluster, and just add new things. However, a big caveat. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a big caveat. This is very expensive to run at home, right? If you're just gonna run it for fun, I use the term very expensive. I I think you have to pay money. That's the thing, right? Seven fifty. Uh, Seven dollars fifty. Um. Again, you know. Just putting it out there, we're not uh, we're not uh, advocating that. Oh, you should spend seven dollars a month to manage three containers at home. It's a great nifty tool. You can play with it. You can you can learn like that. Um, ultimately, mm -hmm. this is for proper high scale, um, you know, yeah. enterprise deployments. Not even enterprise deployments, but if you have mm -hmm. hardware on premises, if you have invested as a company into servers, into racks, into things. Um, do not let that go to waste. Uh, if you're running things yeah. in containers, you can mix and match both the cloud and on-premises uh, through the same console, right? That's just wonderful. That's the benefit mm -hmm. here, right? Oh, yeah. R running your Raspberry Pis at home is fun, but it's a novelty, right? So, uh, yeah, that's, oh, yeah. That's how it works. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's <sighs> like... Um... One of the things, the more stuff I run at home, the more I realize I don't want to run things at home because um, some of you might be aware, we frequently get power interruptions in South Africa yep. due to various reasons. So I've got a big UPS that can run for, I think, three hours at the moment, which is normally enough to cover the power outage. Yeah. But before that, I had a smaller UPS. So I had that small UPS configured in, um, with, and then connected to one of the yep. servers running uh, NUT-D. Then it had multiple um, other copies of NUT-D trying to communicate and shut them down in the right order and safely... No, I, no, I don't no. want to do that as, on a data center <laughs> level. Um, no. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Yeah. So, you know, managing something, um, again, using excess resources in this case. And I love the fact that because you can almost throw commodity hardware at this, right? Um, uh, you just throw commodity hardware and it's being managed all from the, say, say, from the, from the safety of the cloud. It's just wonderful, right? So, yeah. Mm. Um, lost algorithm. Definitely yes. you can use it. And that, that's the whole point. Yes. Yeah. This Using it for Raspberry print. finds is yeah. fun, right? It's just if you have a cluster at home, if you have things to play with, that's fun and cool. But you absolutely do use this for actual real life scenarios <laughs> where you mm. connect on premises on premises stuff to the cloud. Yeah. Right? So mm. yeah. I mean definitely, I mean, this is one of the things back in the day when because I remember I came from the world before cloud. Um I would have loved to have this. Because we had a rack full of service, I think some like 10, like yeah. home homemade service. And I mean we did we built Genta from scratch on that cluster and ran things, and it's like that was a nightmare. I would not want to do that again. Yeah, uh, I would. I would. I would. I would also agree with Alan Rod. Uh, running pies is not a novelty. I, I agree. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think running pies is great. Um, it's just uh, not a lot of people run pies as a production workload. Not because Raspberry Pis are bad or anything. I think they're amazing, but it's just you get more bang for the buck for a actual. If you want to run a production workload, take 200 bucks and just buy a physical server used one uh, if you want to do it from home. Mm. But do it from the cloud then. <laughs> I think it's Me, much better. I, I need to, uh, <laughs> this is the one when I next have a, a need. Uh, let me actually just open this up again. So I'm not affiliated to HP or I not, don't get any money from them. But yeah. this one over here, wait, sorry, the mouse over here, this, this little ProLiant one. Yeah. Um, uh, is that's the next thing I want to buy because when uh, let me just show you when you open it up. And if anybody knows of different servers that actually come in this type of form factor at this price point and things, please shout because I I love boxes. Can I have them? I love the fact that two guys who work for a cloud vendor here uh, are talking about uh, there you go. <laughs> buying on premises equipment. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it doesn't have proper photos. No. Okay. But in case, so this one at the front, you can open it up and it can take four three and a half inch drives. Yeah. And the back, it got it has four gigabit um, network interfaces. Yeah. So, yeah, this is yeah. this is definitely yeah. something I like. But I mean, um, so for those talking about the NUC, I also like the idea of the NUC. 
Um, the only change there is you can only have one hard drive or an X, I think one hard drive with it. Well, um, mine even has like yeah. an M SATA. That's it. That, that the only yeah, thing that mine has. Yeah. See, for, for me, as a box hugger, this is this is super nice. The four drives, and over there, you can see, uh, let's zoom in, four network adapters. Yeah. That's just like, oh, I want that. I want to be able to hug my box at home. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Cool. Um, awesome. Yeah. So, um, with that being said, um, this has been a kind of a review on how Cobus is, runs his traffic at home, how he runs, it, runs it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how he runs his a lot of his a lot of his containers at home and uh the, in, the, in fact you can actually manage your servers and your containers straight from the cloud using services such, such as aws uh systems manager and uh ecs or elastic contain container service uh anywhere um mm. basically able to do things from a cloud dashboard which is pretty cool um, um we've heard a lot of folks running here some containers at home as well which is pretty cool i think a lot of us do um um, it's, it's just a fun thing to, to do as well. Um, join us next time, next week at the same place, same time. So next Wednesday, 1 p.m. Central European time. Join us again for a new stream of Dev Beard Ops where these two gentlemen talk. Um, we're going to be covering, um, not sure, we're, we're going to see if, if Kobus manages to fix, uh, mm. to get his containers maintained by by um, ECS anywhere by ECS anywhere in, in any case, do follow us on, the, on, on social media. We will be announcing the streams and all that stuff. So just do that stuff and yeah um bo, bo b0 x9 uh um, it's the xkcd chart to uh worth time of automation that's just the best chart ever right um this thing here this one yeah. uh <laughs> so the answer about that is as well. no i want my home automated i don't care how long it takes <laughs> Yes, this chart is <laughs> this chart is perfectly valid, but uh, the engineer the engineers in us are just like mm. we love automating things. So and we understand you do as well. So have fun, have fun automating stuff. So cool. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, feel free to send us any suggestions, comments, ideas to our social media handles. You can find them at the bottom of this thing here. We're also my name is Darko Mesros. This is Kobus Bernard. You can find us on, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Twitter, MySpace, Friendster, no IRC, free notes. Um, you can you can find us all over just let us know send us suggestions comments we're, we're happy to get your messages um mm. and yeah we will be seeing you um next wednesday at the same time same place yes okay goodbye cheers